everybody welcome back to my channel so I'm just sitting here in Jill's dining room waiting for the bus to come I, I have a few minutes I'm going to use it wisely to make a video but what I want to talk to y'all about today is this murder mystery trial that's going on I'll go into a little bit of background of it and y'all can let me know whether or not you're watching it or if you've heard anything about it or even if you live down in Georgia. I'm sure the state of Georgia has been flooded with media about this um, this murder, murder mystery. I mean, it's a real-life murder mystery, and in my opinion, it's better than any book that John Grisham could have ever written or any or murder mystery, true crime mystery writer. I don't think John Grisham is really a true crime mystery writer, but let's say Anne Rice, you know, some of those great mystery writers. But it's just fascinating, and it, it's, a, it's a look uh, into the, the side of a marriage where... It, just looking in from the outside, you would think that this family has the perfect marriage. I mean, the man uh, who was murdered, he was a very um, successful, wealthy attorney. Uh, his wife was beautiful, and she's not so pretty now, but, <laughs> um, you know, they just had, had it all. He had a good education. He went to law school. Uh, I think he went a little bit later in life. And he became a very successful attorney, and I think they're from Alabama. And um, he accepted it. He got pr promoted f with the firm that he was with, and he got transferred to Atlanta. And um, so they had bought a, a nice home there. I think it was a, a townhouse or... Yeah, I believe they described it as a townhouse, but I'm not going to go into a lot of background because y'all know I like to keep my videos under uh, 10 minutes if possible. But anyway, his name is Gary, and his wife's name is Melody, and they have four children. Uh, the oldest one's name is Chris. He's in his 30s now, and then the second son is Scott. I believe he's in his 30s, and um, they had a daughter named Amanda, and then a daughter came later in life, the, I call it the menopause baby, <laughs> I don't know uh, what it is, but anyway, the midlife crisis baby, she came later in life, and her name is Emily, so they just seemed to have it all, and um, Melody started having, I don't know when she started having affairs with other men, but it's been going on for a very long time. I would imagine at least 20 years. And Gary knew about it. And some of the men that Melody was having an affair with, um, they thought that they were in an open marriage, but they weren't. Um, so I guess she told them that it was an open marriage. And um, even the children described it as, living separate lives in in one house and I wouldn't really call it a mansion but it was the home that Gary bought for her I'm not sure if he bought it already built or if they had it built I, I kind of think that he might have had it built because she was having an affair with a man that had horses and she talked about how she loved riding his horses so uh, Gary the the husband he bought her a horse for him. You know, he just did everything that he could for this ungrateful, spoiled, um, manipulating woman. And, I mean, she just, I, I can't even imagine what kind of wife she was and how all the mistreatment and all of the, the family dynamics and the problems that went on within the marriage. I mean, my mother had affairs throughout her marriage and whether Daddy knew about it or not, I still to this day don't know. But, I mean, we lived in a little tiny town that everybody gossiped. I mean, Lumberton, back then, it was like 2,000 residents. So tiny, everybody knew everybody's business. You know, I, like I said, I don't really know if Daddy knew, but he sure suspected it because Mama would go out and when she was planning on meeting her boyfriend, she would go out and raise a hood on the car and disconnect the um, the speedometer or the odometer wire. I mean, she was very good at, she was a lot like Melanie and manipulating and conniving and scheming of ways to get away uh, to meet her boyfriend. I know one time when I was about, 
six or seven, and my sister Bobby would have been about 11, uh, Mama had told Daddy that she was taking us to the zoo in Hattiesburg, and it was called Kemper Zoo, and I just hated it. I, I always had fear and panic in my stomach every time Mama would go, even though I was too young to realize the reason that she was going. And she would always pick up Maggie, our um, babysitter who lived over there in the quarters by the railroad track. And I loved Maggie, so I was looking forward to spending the day with her. But it was so hot in that old Kemper Zoo, and it stunk, and those old baboons, all they ever did was turn their butts up <laughs> to you. And, oh, I just remember how disgusting and, and how stinking it was. But it was a ruse. You know, Mama lied to Daddy and told Daddy that she was taking us to the zoo, but she didn't. She dropped us off there with Maggie and went and met her boyfriend. Anyway, so this story, it takes place in Alpharetta, Georgia, and the name of the family is um, the husband that was killed. His name is Gary Ferris, F-A-R-R-I-S, and the wife is Melanie Ferris, Melody Ferris. Um, I got to talk fast. It was found dead in the in the burn pile in, in the woods back behind their house. And it's very fascinating how all of the elements that are within the mystery come about. And the the trial has been gone on for a couple of weeks, so I can't watch all of it. But, so I haven't watched all of it, but I've watched enough to where in the beginning, I really thought that she was the one who killed Garrett. Initially, they tried to make it look like he was always burning stuff and at the burn pile all the night, all the time, and he was fascinated with fire. So they tried to make it look like he had just fallen in the fire and burned to death. But then, upon examination, they called in the medical examiner, the coroner, and also an anthropologist. Well, the anthropologist, you know, she's uh, educated in bones and all the different fragments, bone fragments and everything. And I mean, he was burned to a crisp. I mean, there was nothing, nothing left hardly. And he was more or less cremated. But the anthropologist found uh, in his rib bone, she found a, a projectile. It was from a thirty-eight. Uh, handgun. So then, you know, immediately it turned into a murder investigation. This happened in 2018. He was murdered around July the 4th, July the 5th, I think the night going into July the 5th uh, of 2018. So it's just now coming to trial. Now, the district attorney, mm, he's good, but he's not as good as the district attorney was in the, the Murdoch trial in my opinion. But he's doing the best that he can with what he has to work with. But now the family, they're, they're all fighting, and um, the son, the two sons, Scott and Chris, they're fighting and blaming the mother, saying that the mother murdered their father, that she shot him, and, and then uh, carted his 300-pound body off and I think he was like 6'5", to the burn pile. But then Melody, she's trying to blame the murder on Scott and Chris, specifically Scott. Scott was like a freeloading son. He never really, uh, he did go to Iraq. He did join the, the army, I think, and went to Iraq. But he, he lived on the farm and he piddled around with the farm equipment and, and the machinery and everything and fed the animals. But he was a freeloader. He he didn't really work. He he worked, you know, hit or miss here and there. And and I think Gary, he must have been very passive in in the marriage. And Melody was very aggressive. I mean, she she um, ruled the roost. Let me say, if you get a chance to watch it, once you get started, you're not going to be able to stop. I I can't watch it during the day because I'm busy. You know, like today, I've got to get the kids off the bus. I got to give them a snack. I got to help with uh, taekwondo and soccer and dance and all of those things that my daughter needs help with after school. And I am more than happy to do it because my my family is my life, and I would never do what this woman has done to her family. And to think that she had it all. I mean, the the little bit of the inside of the home that I've seen, I mean, it was top-notch. I mean, exquisite, beautiful. One of the lawyers that, ad, that um, 
that testified. He, uh, they did ask him about, you know, the life insurance policies and Gary's income. Apparently, he he was earning around six hundred thousand a year, but it got to the point to where Melody was running off and having affairs with all of these men that Gary cut her off. I mean, he took the credit card away from her and the debit card. She did have a debit card. But one of the daughters testified the reason for the debit card wasn't so much that she could have access to the money, but that he would know wherever she was at because he would get a notification uh, in his email whenever the debit card was used. So, y'all, this is just fascinating. And I will leave the link. Um, I'm watching it on Law and Crime, but I think it's also covered on Court TV. So I will leave the link below. And y'all watch it. If, if you start from the beginning, I watch it and then let me know if you think Melody is guilty. Um, today, after watching what just happened uh, in the last week, I'm having my doubts. I think I think somebody else did it. So, um, anyway, I just wanted to talk to y'all about that. I gotta go. Oh, y'all, please give me a thumbs up and share. And if you're new here, please subscribe. And y'all, just keep on coming back. Have a great week, guys. Bye.